These days, it seems like every outdoorsman on YouTube is focused on the 1% of wilderness survival events that actually occur. They all seem to ignore the catastrophic emergencies that millions of Americans actually experience every year. Wildfire, hurricanes and tornadoes, flooding, blizzards, many other real world events that actually do occur. Millions of Americans are totally unprepared for this. Not anymore. Welcome to the Modern Survival Series. Welcome back everybody. I'm Randall and this is Grunt Proof. If you are a fan of the outdoors, adventure, and gear reviews as well as tips and tricks for the outdoorsman, the everyday Joe, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps this channel out greatly. Thank you. Today we are talking about wildfire survival. It affects millions of people every year and it seems like every year these same people are caught off guard despite knowing there's a risk, knowing there is a fire in the area, and having a year to prepare for that possibility. What I'm going to do today is I'm gonna give you guys some crucial tips. We're gonna get into planning, rehearsals, and execution, and I'm gonna help you guys avoid becoming a victim of a wildfire. As I learned in my grunt days, as well as all my military experience, to accomplish any mission somewhat successfully, it comes down to planning, rehearsals, and execution. A major part of planning is the rehearsals part, and also what a lot of people seem to forget is refining that plan. So when it comes to wildfires, you know when the season is, and most people have access to some kind of information to alert them that a fire is in their area. A great majority of these people just sit at home, they do nothing about it, they don't take any steps, they don't even have a plan, and they just wait for somebody else to come along and save them. Unfortunately, a lot of these people are caught off guard despite this happening every year, and they seem to ignore the warning signs, they fail to plan, and hey, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Okay, so let's get into planning. With a wildfire, as soon as it becomes a threat to you and your homestead, you are most likely going to want to evacuate. Now, as you start to build your wildfire preparedness plan, you are going to create some steps. These steps should be written out in an actual step-by-step -step format on your phone, and you also should probably have some kind of hard copy in your house where it can easily be found. So you know when you leave your house, there are a couple things you are gonna have to turn off. Maybe some things you're going to have to set up and turn on. We're gonna get to that. You are gonna have to have certain foods and items prepared, hopefully in some kind of big box that you just throw into your vehicle. For a wildfire, you should have at least three exit routes planned. We call these courses of action. So you're gonna have a main route, a secondary, and a tertiary, and depending on where the fire is or what's happening once you begin your evacuation, if something is wrong with one of your routes, you don't sit there and freak out and get stressed out and get yourself killed. You just revert to plan B or plan C, your other courses of action. And having all this written down in a step-by-step, -step, clear, short, concise process helps you focus. I know a lot of people who haven't been to war or have not been in any kind of traumatic situations, you just can't fathom the idea that when an emergency comes, an actual life-threatening emergency, you will get caught up into all kinds of crazy thought processes. If you don't have a checklist to follow that's really simple, you're gonna start to freak yourself out, you're gonna forget things, and you might just freeze and do absolutely nothing. So that is all part of the planning process. Okay, so what is next? Now we went to rehearse and refine the plan. So once you have a solid plan and you think you have it worked out, you are going to rehearse it. And I'm not talking about, okay, we're gonna pretend to put our stuff in the trunk, we're gonna pretend to get in the car and drive away, we're gonna do this. And then once it comes down to an emergency, you have done everything notionally, so you have not put it into the step and planning process. So when it comes to the emergency, you're going to forget a whole bunch of stuff. Plan and run rehearsals with yourself and whoever else could be involved. When I was a kid, my family did this with fire drills and tornado warnings all the time. With rehearsals, give the alert, go through your step-by-step -step process, and actually perform 
all the steps. So shut power off, turn hoses on, or turn other things off, close doors, grab your food box, the most important piece of item you are going to bring with you. Put it in there. Check off everybody that is supposed to be in the vehicle with you and do a check with those people. You get a head count before you roll out. Believe me, guys, it is very easy to leave somebody behind in a life or death situation. It is frighteningly easy. So in the infantry, we always did what's called a green two. Before we rolled out anywhere, or if we got into contact, as soon as we stopped, we did a head count on personnel and equipment. Before you do anything else, you have to be accountable for your people and your items. And if you actually put all of this into your rehearsals, this is where we get into refining the plan. So you may get into rehearsals and you may realize you are missing some items. There's some crucial things that you didn't think about when you were sitting there jotting it down on paper. You may also find that you have way too many things to do and you have to knock off things like, okay, it's gonna take us an hour to get out of here. We're gonna be dead. Now, just to give you guys an example of my plan and help you start to create your own, I am in a heavy wildfire threatened area. So I'm gonna go a little bit into my plan and I'm also gonna show you guys a couple really cool tips that I have not seen other people share, at least on YouTube. Now, I have a checklist on my phone. This phone is always with me out here. And I also have a hard copy right at my front door that I can pull out of a drawer. I know exactly where it is. Everybody around me knows where it is. And we know if there is a possibility of a fire in the area, we pull that list out and we start going through the checklist. We do nothing before we grab that checklist. As an example, my step one is turn on the radio. I don't have internet or cell service where I am. I cannot get an alert on my phone, but we do have all kinds of radios out here. And so I have all the emergency and the NOAA channels programmed into that radio. So I can also turn on that radio while I'm going to grab that checklist and have the alerts coming in so I can start to get up to date information. So what actually alerts me to do this? Well, number one is my senses. You know, if I smell smoke, especially during the summer, I'm thinking wildfire because nobody's burning stuff out here. There's not even campfires. The next thing is if I see smoke, okay? So if, if I see or smell smoke, I know it's pretty close. So I need to spring into action quick. Just uh, shooting some stuff over here. Rehearsals, the radios work. Another thing I'm going to do to confirm, and I have actually put up a video about this where I thought there was a wildfire in my area, but I got nothing on the radio. So once I've grabbed my checklist and I have the radio going, if I don't sense any immediate danger around me, I'm going to put up my drone. And that is going to tell me, number one, if there's a fire, number two, where it is, and number three, which route I can take. So I only have three routes off of this mountaintop that I can actually use. Putting my drone up helps me locate where the fire is and then I can decide which route to take. Let's say the wind is too high, or for some reason I can't put up my drone or I don't want to. Well, if I don't see smoke or fire in my immediate vicinity, I can always hop out on the quad and go around and I have lookout points all in the area that I can go try to spot this fire from. So after I've chosen my route, we're gonna get my escape kit. I have a box prepped and ready to go. It has plenty of stuff that I can take with me and it's going to sustain me in the truck and also to wherever I get for a couple days. With that being said, I do carry a backpack with me and that is part of my plan. But as far as wildfire goes, I do not put into my plan that I'm going to escape on foot. If you have not seen the terrain I am working with out here, and when we're talking about wildfires, they usually spread very rapidly because of high winds. So I know in this terrain, if I have to escape wildfire on foot and it's high winds, I'm not gonna make it. And if I try to start sprinting downhill with a heavy ruck on and possibly family members in tow, we're all going to die in the forest no matter what. So for my plan, I got the three routes to get out of here. I choose a primary one and then I adjust as needed. Like with the kit you're gonna take with you, that's gonna be up to you to figure out what you need to put in there. And you're gonna have to figure out if you're gonna go on foot or not. Again, in a wildfire situation with high winds, I strongly suggest you do not try to do it on foot. So then I have a couple devices that I turn on. We're gonna get to that. Those are very special. So then everybody's mounted up. I get a head count on personnel and equipment, and then we roll out. So now I'm gonna show you one thing that a lot of people have no clue about, and then I'm gonna show you something else that a lot of people know about, but absolutely refuse to do. I have a ton of property out here, and look at it. The highest points of the grass 
are out there. I have a minimum 100 feet from my house to any kind of tall or risky brush. And your state's wildfire safety website is going to have something like that on there. You need to have what's called a buffer zone around your house to where you don't have a whole bunch of dead grass in the immediate area of your house that's just going to come right up to it and your house is done. I know people in the rural communities or even some of the suburbs that have caught on fire, they can't really do this. But if you had the possibility to build defensible space, you have to do it. So if you live in a crowded neighborhood that is fire prone, I would suggest instead of waiting on the authorities or the government to come save you, you need to get together with your community and see how you can create a defensible space around your neighborhood. You're a community, right? You're all going to die or survive together. So you might want to get them involved in actually taking care of the community. That is the American way, right? I've got my defensible space. I've got a ravine over here and only my tall grass in the area is on the other side of that. I've got a little bit here, but it's still green. And then I have a road up there. And then I have a little trail here. About 50 feet that way, I have another trail. About 100 feet that way, I have a major trail going to the houses. I have a road over here and I have a buffer zone over there. These roads are actually not roads. You can use them as trails. I drive on them on the ATVs. Out here in the wilderness, we use them to walk along and use the ATVs, but they are actually called fire breaks, okay? So there are certain dimensions you can follow to build your own fire breaks. The whole point of them is you want to have a space between any type of possibly dead vegetation to where hopefully it won't hop across that road and continue going. Whenever the forestry guys are out there fighting fires, the linemen, that's pretty much what they're doing. They're just making new fire breaks and hoping the fire doesn't skip across those roads. If you live in a community and you don't have access to a bulldozer, I guarantee you somebody in that neighborhood can get one for you or owns one and you can ask them to do the job for you. And if you can't find somebody in your neighborhood that can work for you to do that job, guys, you can rent this stuff. You can rent backhoes and everything. And it's really not as expensive as you may think. It's definitely not as expensive to make a couple roads for a couple days than it would be to replace your entire freaking house and all of your belongings. Okay, everybody has access to these. We have a hose and a pretty decent sprinkler system. Most of the year, we use it to water our grass. The thing is, however, for the summertime for us, all this grass dies anyway. So there's no point in me trying to water that during the summer. So what I do is I put my sprinklers on corners. There's one, there's two, there's a third one back there on my backyard. So I have written into my plan before I mount up in the vehicle, I come and I turn this entire sprinkler system on. So the idea is my sprinklers are going to cover the whole area in front of the house and they're also going to spray most of my house down. So hopefully it gives it enough time to wet down everything so it won't combust. And then also if it does get too hot, the water will hopefully keep the flames down a little bit until it dies down. So it is just a theory and a hope, but for me, it's just one very easy extra step I can add in that might help. Last thing, I think everybody has seen these 275 or 250 gallon water jugs. Yeah, 275. So you can actually get these used for dirt cheap and people use them for all kinds of things, okay? I put them out here for an emergency fire system. Of course, if my well breaks and I'm totally out of water, I could drink out of this. I could purify it and use it for drinking water. But it basically sits in this strategic spot for one reason. In the winter time, I have a hose coming off that gutter that catches a ton of rain and it comes right into there. Every winter, I can fill this thing up within a couple days. Now you see where the opening valve is and look at the terrain. It flows right into a ditch along my road. Let's keep following it. It flows out into this ditch. And watch. And because of the terrain, this will actually flood this whole lower area. And I actually test this every year. Every year in the wintertime, I will dump the whole system so I can get fresh water into it and also to test out this system. And at least for the last two years in a row, I have done this, it will flood most of this front yard. Eventually I will get second and third tanks 
and I will put them on each end of my property. So that will just be one extra watering system to hopefully help prevent my house from catching on fire. Well, there you go, guys. So we have everything covered. Plan, rehearse, and refine, and execute. If you follow this basic advice and just rehearse your plan a couple times a year, you should be pretty well prepared. And honestly, when I find that all these Americans, when they get into trouble in wildfires, their main problem is that they have no plan and they are not prepared at all. So as I said, guys, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Don't be that guy. It's really too easy to make a plan and rehearse it, practice it with your family, constantly improve it, and then hopefully you won't become just another statistic. Well, that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the very first video of the Modern Survival Series. As I said, this survival series is designed for the everyday average Joe American, and we're focusing on events that actually happen to millions of people across America every freaking year. Stay tuned for the remaining videos of the Modern Survival Series, where we are going to get into other topics such as flooding, hurricanes, and tornadoes, and other everyday experiences that millions of Americans deal with. Be sure to like and subscribe, click the bell so you get notified for every video, and until that new video, I will see you guys in the outdoors. Prepare yourself. Thank <laughs> you.